All right, friends. Uh, well, I am really excited about today's class. Uh, you know, as you know, we have gone through uh, our topics um, for the year. And so today, we're going to look at historiography, which is a big word that simply means the writing of history. And we're going to look at different approaches to that writing that might help you as uh, you think about your last analytical writing assignment, which is due next week. Um, also, after today's class, next week, we will do a review of both semesters. We'll look at every topic um, in, in some way and uh, have opportunities to go back to review those principles um, that have been so meaningful for us. And then for our last class, uh, we will have an opportunity to take the final exam for those of you who like to take it, and you can take it in class uh, if you'd like. So you'll have two hours to take it. It'll be due, if you'd like it to be on time, by 5.30, which is when we normally end class. So um, anyway, that is what we have coming up. So we're, we are at the end, uh, but I'm really, really excited for today's um, class to get together. So let's start and uh, let's see. What about Caleb? Would you be willing to offer our opening prayer? Yeah. And uh, perhaps if you just stand close to, to this microphone, <laughs> that, uh, let's try that. that might work. Okay. Thank you so much. Our dear, kind, and gracious Father in heaven, we thank thee for this beautiful day. And we thank thee for the chance we have to come and gather as a class today. We ask that thy spirit may be with us to help us to understand the story of thy country that thou hast established and preserved and help us to better understand ways that we may express the history that is rich with thy hand. We thank thee for the gospel and for the restoration that came forth in America and the freedom that we have here to be able to worship as we as we choose. Blessed to be able to be educated in our rights that we may preserve that freedom for ourselves and for the generations who follow. And we hope say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that wonderful prayer. Well, friends, as, as I said, I really am excited today. What you'll see before you, and I think we all have one. Um, oh, thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. We can each have a, a microphone, <laughs> almost. So, and uh, great. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Um, you know, as, as you look here, you'll see seven different books. Uh, and uh, each of these books comes at the writing of history in a different way. Uh, you'll see not only uh, different methods for historical research, um, but also different writing styles. Uh, you'll see different philosophies about history embedded in these texts. And uh, I think you'll see some things that you agree with in many ways, uh, but you'll also see some things that my hope is that you, you, you would reason that you disagree with. Uh, and then that's important, too, because certainly the lessons of the past, uh, as well as the lessons of the writing about the past uh, that we're going to talk about today, hold both lessons about what to do as well as lessons about what not to do. Um, and so this is just a sampling. I tried to think about books uh, that write history in different ways. You'll see we will start our discussion with David Hackett Fisher's Paul Revere's Ride, which was published by Oxford University Press in 1994. And then we'll move on to David Cohen, Chasing the Red, White, and Blue, which was published by Picador in 2001. We'll look at a, a very interesting uh, textbook by Joseph R. Conlon, The American Past, A Survey of American History, Volume 1, uh, that was published by Thompson Wadsworth in 2007. Uh, then we'll look at a classic uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book uh, by Bernard Balin, The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution, published by the Belknap Press of uh, the Harvard University Press in 1967. Uh, we'll look at a very interesting book, one that uh, was both praised as brilliant uh, as well as uh, derided as far too controversial in its methods. That's uh, by Natalie Zeman Davis, uh, The Return of Martin Gare, uh, published by uh, Harvard University Press, 1983. Then we'll look at one that actually won the Pulitzer Prize last year, or for 2014, published in 2014, so won the prize for 15. The prizes for 16 just came out. Uh, this is Elizabeth A. Fenn's Encounters at the Heart of the World by Hill and Wang, and that was, as I said, 2014. And uh, finally, we'll take a look at this really interesting book uh, by Terrell L. Gibbons, By the Hand of Mormon, The American Scripture That Launched a New World Religion, and that's by Oxford University Press, 2002. These are all books uh, that I have really enjoyed. I have them in my personal library, um, and I either had them because I've been assigned to read them uh, in, in a class in college or, grad or graduate school, uh, or just simply because I, I purchased them and enjoyed reading them. Um, but you'll see that, uh, as I said, uh, please 
keep a lookout for both what to do as well as what not to do as, as we look here today. Let's start with the first one. Uh, and the reasoning question that I would like to ask uh, here uh, for all of these will be at the top. Reason positives and negatives for each of the following approaches to historiography. Um, what I'd like you to do uh, is hopefully, as Caleb has uh, a notebook, uh, and you may have either a notebook or certainly at least on the back, um, you could also um, make a record um, as we follow this four-hour process. Uh, we have research here in front of us. Each of these excerpts is research. We'll then reason um, according to truth, positives and negatives. You'll see things that you agree with both in the writing style uh, as well as in the subject matter. You'll also see things that you disagree with in the writing style as well as the subject matter. Um, you'll see different philosophies of history embedded um, in each of these texts. And like I said, before, some you'll agree with and some you won't. Um, and so um, would you record your reasoning um, from the research that we'll do together in T-charts? Uh, and you can make these very simple. If I were you, uh, I would simply put at the top the title of the book, and I'd have my T-chart. On the one side, I would put positive or positives. On the other side, I'd put negative or negative. Um, and that would then help you. Um, to uh, keep a record where you're keeping track in an organized fashion uh, of some of these things. Anyway, uh, I would invite you to create one T-chart for each of these excerpts, and uh, you'll see there are seven of them. So you might have seven little T-charts uh, by the end uh, that will be a record of your reasoning. Um, anyway, this is, this is a, an activity that I'm really excited about because I, I, was, I was going through this um, with uh, my wife, um, and we had many wonderful conversations about these, uh, and so I'm just excited to have them with you as well. Uh, she hasn't read all of them. She's read a number of them, um, but we've talked about all of them. So, um, all right. Well, let's start with the first one. Uh, this is actually a book that uh, we used for the very first directed reading seminar that we did here at American Heritage School, and this was back... I want to say, yes, this was the fall of 2012. We actually had that class. It was an after-school class. It was for an hour. It was a 3.30 to 4.30 class. And it was held in just uh, the, the lecture hall across the way. And uh, we looked at this book, Paul Revere's Ride, as part of the course, The Minutemen and Their World, which was a really interesting course that we did. And I enjoyed our reasoning and relating in that course. Anyway, this is by David Hackett Fisher. Uh, he is still a professor. Uh, he's been teaching for over uh, 40 years uh, as a professor now. Uh, he's at Brandeis University. I actually worked with him. Um, and he won the Pulitzer Prize for a different book uh, called uh, Washington's Crossing. Uh, this is from a book um, that, that I actually enjoy even more. I, I like Washington's Crossing, but I like this one even better. Uh, so let's just read it together. Um, and, uh, and as we read, um, let's reason. And so I'll give you some time to reason after we read, but uh, why don't we go ahead and, and why don't we take a sentence each? We'll just sort of go around. Uh, now, I, I know the font is a little bit small, but uh, my hope is that uh, at least three of you have young eyes, and your eyes might be better than mine, so, so, so we'll see. Um, all right, and uh, I'll, I'll start with the first sentence here. Uh, welcome. Good to have you. Come join us. Grab a, grab a chair, my friend. And uh, we've got one next to Camilla here, or Caleb. Uh, there's also one next to Brenna. Exotic. What was the, oh, who kind that one? Oh, sorry, we did. Don't, don't sit there. Here you go. Ah, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, so, Leah, if you look at the top of the page, um, you'll see in the box reason positives and negatives for each of the following approaches to historiography. And that's just a big word that means the writing of history. Today we're going to talk about philosophies of history, approaches to writing history, writing styles as you're writing history, um, as well as the ideas that are themselves expressed. We'll analyze those and see what we think. Um, and remember, all of this is part of a writing workshop. Um, I thought, I mean, we could do commas, we could do conjunctions, and, you know, but, but I thought this may be a little, little richer today, um, g given what we've talked about so far in this course. So we'll start, we'll take a sentence each. You can certainly pass if you don't feel like reading for any reason, you have a frog in your throat or a hippopotamus in your throat, uh, whatever the animal might be. Um, but I'll start. Monotomy was the home of Samuel Whittemore, 78 years old and badly crippled, but an old soldier and a strong Whig, meaning patriot. Yeah, what a sway. When you hear that, the reviews you make. Oh, there's a the microphone. That way our friends can hear too. When he heard that the regulars were coming, Whittemore armed himself with a musket, two pistols, and his old cavalry, sorry, cavalry, 
Cowardly Saver and took a strong position behind a stone wall 150 yards from the road. He waited patiently for the British column to approach. When it came in range, Whitmore got off five shots with such speed and accuracy that a large British detachment was sent to root him out. <laughs> As the regulars assaulted his position, what is it Whitmore? Whitmore. Okay. Killed one soldier with his musket and shot two more with his pistol. And he was reaching for his saber. He was reaching for his saber when a British infantryman came up to him and shot away part of his face. Others thrust their bayonets into his body. After the battle, he was found barely alive, bleeding from at least 14 wounds. Friends carried him to Dr. Cotton Tufts of Medford, who shook his head sadly. But Samuel Whittemore confounded his position. <laughs> he lived another 18 years to the ripe age of 96 and populated um, a large part of Middlesex country for, or sorry, with, uh, sorry, um, of Whittemores who are today as tough and independent as a sturdy, sturdy old rebel who stood alone against a British brigade. Uh, good job. <laughs> brigade. Good job, good job. All right, one of my all-time favorite stories from uh, the Concord fight. Um, okay, so let me give you a moment then. So there's the research. We've just read it together. Would you go ahead and take some time to reason? Um, and uh, Leah, you'll see we're making a T-chart. On the one side, we're reasoning positives. On the other side, we're reasoning negatives. And of course, we're reasoning according to truth. Um, as you think about truths in the way that God would have us write history and think about history, what do you like? Go ahead and make a record of that. Um, and on the other hand, what uh, do you not like? What do you disagree with? What's negative and why? One thing that might help, too, is your reasoning is to put yourself in the shoes of someone who is surrounded simply by documents and is trying to write them into a book. There are certainly many choices that you have to make in terms of how you write. How do you tell the story? Do you even tell a story at all? You'll see some of these don't try to tell a story. They're all analysis. This one, as you can see, is telling a story. That's a philosophy of history. Some people think that history shouldn't be storytelling. Others think that it should. Others think that it should be a mix. So anyway, keep those questions in mind. How would you write history if you had these sources in front of you? We just took a look at the very first. His approach to writing history, for example, obviously this is someone that I know better than anybody else on the page um, because I worked with him very closely. I've been in his office many times. We've talked about life. We've eaten lunch together, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and I'll, I'll just say here, um, a little bit of background, um, Dr. Fisher is, is very much committed to the idea that writing history um, should be what he calls a braided narrative. Um, that there is a storyline that you follow from start to finish. Uh, but in that storyline, it's not just a story, that it's also interwoven with analysis, where he's making an argument even as he's telling a story. And that's an interesting thing to think about, especially as you think about your analytical writing paragraphs. Obviously, you only have a paragraph, so you don't have too much time to, you know, to, to do uh, a lot. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question to wrestle with, um, if you are trying to teach someone that constitutional principles are based on God's law, um, do you just have 
here's an example of something in the Constitution, here's a scripture, here's why you can see it's part of God's law. You know, and you just go with a, sort of this argument and you support it, you give an example, you know, that kind of thing. Or, or do you actually try to weave it into a story and think of why somebody would want to weave it into a story? Um, Dr. Fisher um, had a very strong argument for why historians shouldn't just write for themselves, why you should try to reach a larger public. Anyway, so those are just some things to think about as, you, as you're reasoning. You'll see others on uh, this list, and the other six uh, take a different approach. They're not trying to write for a popular audience. They don't want to. join our happy throng. Add another one here. Oh, okay. Great. Let's leave this here. Oh, you're very welcome. I'll just... This one belongs here. Is that okay? Oh, okay. I'm trying very hard not to ruin your order. I apologize. It's okay. Yes, yes. There you go. There you go. Yes. Just so you know, so we've we just read the first excerpt. Um, and we're taking a look at uh, what's in the box here. So we're going to talk about it in a moment. And when do you feel like Pluto? Feel like you're just swimming in the nether regions of the universe. Just, just a moment here, and then, and then we can help you just slip in. There we go. Yes, I just wanted you to feel like you have a seat at the table. Cinderella in the background. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I see that many have stopped, and, and certainly uh, invite you to continue writing as people say things that uh, the Spirit lets you know. Well, I should remember that. So keep, continue that record. But but tell, let, let's take a look first um, at some of the positives. What do you see in the way Dr. Fisher approaches history from this excerpt? Please, Brenna. I think it makes you care about the characters because with him you're wondering, oh no, is he going to survive? Right. It makes you care about him. Yeah, oh, I, I love that. And remember, this is so different from a book in which you would simply have a list of casualties in a battle. How different would this be? You would never know these things about him if he was just on a list. Or maybe he wasn't even mentioned. Maybe he became a number. Right? Many historians simply use quantitative analysis um, and just say, so many died, so many were wounded, so many were missing. Uh, just so you know, if, if you look at the footnotes of this book, I haven't included footnotes, but they all have footnotes. Well, not all, but many of them have footnotes. Um, you'll find that um, simply if you went to that record of monotomy, um, he was listed as one of the missing. 
And so if we only went by that record that day, you'd say, oh, he was missing. What does that mean? I guess they didn't know where he was. I, right? I mean, that, that's all we know. This is very different. So I, I love that. Please. Some of the things that I love about it is that you could picture what was going on. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just you picture someone in a room going over a list of bullet points. Mm -hmm. You're actually there. You can hear the gunshots. You can see, you know, this old man behind a wall mm -hmm. trying to fend off yes. the soldiers. And it kind of to Brenda's point, you get to know the character. It's mm -hmm. not something that just you're reading about that happened a long time ago. It's you're there. Mm -hmm. You're part of the history with yeah. it. So I love the way he, he used the story to just to develop the character like Brenna said, and really did put you in the setting with yes. him. I thought it was really cool that he did that. So. Oh, definitely. And I, and I love how he, he has such a good example here of show, don't tell. Right? He gives you this story, and then at the very end, he summarizes it with this idea that he was an independent and sturdy old rebel, tough and independent, right? Um, anyway, I, I, I love that. Please, Mr. Anderson. So I think part of the magic of stories generally, or narratives, or these sequences mm -hmm. of events is that it's easy to follow, it's easy to visualize and imagine. And so when it's easy to follow a story, then it's easier for more people to become excited by the story. And as you suggested by an earlier comment, I think you reach a broader audience mm -hmm. if it's more consumable. Yes. Right? A list of dates or facts or right. may not be as consumable for a broader audience than a narrative that paints a picture of, you know, perhaps details leading to a climax, yes. and, you know, the up and down of a story, of a storyline. Oh, I, I love that, because this book just, you know, is filled with short stories about individuals, just like this one. They're filled throughout the book, they give it that kind of color, that interest. Please. Um, can I add on to Mr. Anderson? Um, so I have a hard time with uh, books that just name stuff like we were saying, sure. like history books especially. But when it has stories like these um, that have detail and um, have just like suspense kind of mm -hmm. thing, it makes it a lot more interesting. So that's why I like a lot of that. Yes, thank you for that. Please, Camille. Um, I've been thinking a lot about like um, the power that the author has over your opinion mm -hmm. and um, like if you switch it around, like you could take the um, the side of like the the people who he's fighting against, yeah. or if you if you if he wasn't a rebel, if he was um, one of the other soldiers, um, you could he really had the author really has the the power to influence how you feel about the person. Mm -hmm. So like he can really control like the side that you stand on for the time that you're reading the book, yeah. and so it just like makes you think like what if this was like someone on the other side, like if, if it wasn't one of the rebels. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. What, what a great, what a great bit of reasoning there. Uh, because certainly, I mean, if you look, right, what perspective is, is Fisher writing from? It's clearly the American, right? Because, because we, we don't have, at least in this, I know this is an excerpt, so you know, obviously there's a lot more to the book, you can read more about it too. But at least in this part here, think of it, right? Um, Whittemore is the actor. All the attention is centered on him, right? That is, that is a very purposeful narrative decision made in the way the story is told by the author, as, as Camilla is saying, because I mean, if you look at what the British are reduced to, you know, we have, there's a British column, right, they're going to approach, you know, a large British detachment was sent to root him out, you know, there are no details about the soldiers there, and obviously you can't tell details about everybody in every story, especially if you're in a battle, you know, but yeah, it is interesting, what choices did he make consciously, you know, what's he focusing on, so I, I love that, I love that, but let's do a little bit of a, a relating for a moment. Um, tell me, when is a time when you have had to consciously decide how to tell a story? And how did you decide how you wanted to tell it? This happens all the time. Every day, my day we were telling stories. It could be very short. Yeah. I think it really depends on your audience and mm -hmm. who you're trying to um, tell a story to because um, if you're telling it to a close friend, you can go into a lot. I feel like you can go into more details and just kind of root, uh, say things and they'll understand you just because they know who you are. And with with a broader audience, you have to go into to more details and focus on your word choice more okay. to get the same belief and trust. Hear that? Definitely interesting. Yeah. 
Um, so this is something that our bishop actually talks with us about. Um, and he used last week, we have a girl in our Sunday school class, and he was teaching. Mm. He said, so you had dance competition. If you were going to tell me about it, you mm. wouldn't tell me every single move that right. you did, because I wouldn't understand it. But my wife, who did drill, you would probably go into a little more detail, maybe talk about the different routines you did. But your mom, I'm sure you told everything. And he related that as to how we share the gospel, where with someone, like we use language at church that we wouldn't use with people who wouldn't understand it because they don't know what we're talking about. And so it kind of got me thinking a little bit, the more that you introduce, the more you have to explain. And so there's a really delicate line of too much detail, mm -hmm. because the more detail that you add, the more complex things that adds to the rest of the storyline following. Uh, I think he did a really good job here. He didn't, like like you said, the soldiers in the column, that's about as far as they got. You know, He focused on what he wanted to focus on and brought that out. He didn't do too much. He didn't explain too much. Mm -hmm. um, so just trying to keep in mind who you're writing to. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if this was to a general group of someone like you, mm -hmm. like a bunch of Use, which would right. be amazing, but you know they would probably be a little more detail in there because it wouldn't have to be explained as much. But to a broader audience, you condense it a little more to to what they can understand without ruining the narrative you're trying to. Do. Yes, so. definitely. Oh, thank you so much for that. I love I love that comment. Anything else that you noticed in your reasoning? Did you see any negatives for you? Please. Uh, I guess a small one could be uh, with this possible inaccuracy because you're telling a story. Okay. And so you want to make it interesting, but you don't know what that really happened. Like the line, friends carried him to Dr. Cotton Tufts of Medford, who shook his head sadly. And, you know, that may or may not have happened. Um, and I think it's okay just as long as you know that probably didn't happen. That is a really, really important point because, once again, um, I haven't looked at everything that he used to write this one paragraph. We could go back, and he has footnotes, we could go back and read, you know, were there journal entries involved, were there newspaper articles, was there, was there a painting, where is this coming from? But certainly, the detail of shaking his head, I mean, did the doctor write that in his journal? And then I shook my head, I mean, because if he didn't, how do we feel about someone taking that kind of liberty? Because if they're taking liberty with something that seems to make sense, but yet what if it didn't happen? Is that playing with the past too much? Is that playing in a way that we disagree with? But yet, it certainly makes for good storytelling versus just, and then he was brought to this doctor. The doctor received him and shook his head sadly. I mean, right, that's a lot more interesting. What do you think about that? What do you do when you don't have all of the facts? Do you feel that you stick straight to what you have in sources, or do you ever go beyond? Mr. Anderson. A good analogy for that is the connect the dots kind of exercise mm -hmm. that all of us have done as children. Sure. Right? You have dots and you can connect them in order. And if you wanted to add a little bit more curvature to the picture, you could embellish a little bit your connections between the dots, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, um, it sometimes comes out a boxy figure. Right. They're perfectly straight lines, yes. right? And I think most of these historians are making their best guess that most doctors, upon seeing this right. kind of circumstance, would shake their heads sadly, right? And so it's a pretty safe bet, but you're right, it's a bet. Right. And it's a departure from primary sources, which is what this has done. Like yeah. you said, weaving is a braid, lots of primary sources, and then probably making a few assumptions along yes. the way. Yes. Right? And, and you think culturally, too, today, doesn't it make sense that we might shake our head in a situation like that? What if culturally shaking of the head wasn't as prominent then? What if it meant something else? I'm not saying that it did, but you know what I mean? Suddenly we have this assumption that in every culture, at every time, everybody had the same habits. You know? And then he waved to the person who he hadn't seen in a long time. Well, in Korea, there are some waves that are really rude. Right? For example, to go like this, oh, come here, please. That is one of the worst things you can do in Korea. Right. Nobody would ever imagine that here, right? Because it's pretty common. Right? When you call a person, you have to go like this. Because if you use one finger, that's very, very rude. But yet if you're an American author writing with American assumptions from just the culture that we're part of, you could say, oh, and then he just said, oh, come on, you know, wagging his index finger, you know, in their direction. 
And a Korean say, <gasps> no, the Korean general didn't do that. <laughs> right? Please. Sometimes we may make strange assumptions about prophets in the past. Mm -hmm. My sister made a point of this in something she wrote one time when she said, we, we may look back at Isaiah or at Moses or some of the right. Old Testament prophets and think, well, that was really strange. Right. right? Yeah. Why in the world did they do that? But it was just part of the culture. And if we fast forward a few hundred years and have our children who might grow up in the millennium and not, you know, potentially, how we imagine if, if, if the lambs lie down and the lion are right. lying together, maybe they would look back at us and see um, certain Halloween traditions is pretty gruesome, like, sure. you know, or certain kinds of, yes. even, you know, uh, funny little things that we do at birthday parties, you know, or whatever it may be that's, that's just strange. And they may say, wow, they were kind of, that grandpa or great-grandpa so-and-so, right? that was a weird custom, right? Exactly. And so anyway, we just have to give some benefit of the doubt sure. to people. Sure. Oh, and I love that. So anyway, I guess this is an interesting question. Um, and so, because to me, and once again, you don't want to take this too far, but, but there is a question. If you're making up the shaking of a head, what else are you making up? And how do we know? And do we really have to go back as the reader and read every single source to say, oh, you took liberties here and here and here. And they may seem benign, right, fairly innocuous, that they're not terribly harmful or sinister. You know, they're not going to do damage, but... Could they do damage? For example, what if the doctor didn't shake his head but said, yes, I've been waiting for this guy to die for years because I want his clock. What if that was a backstory that we had no idea about, right? But yet, here Fisher is, we're just thinking through this. I mean, he's a great guy. I love him. Uh, I really do. I have great respect for him. Um, but can you imagine if there had been some backstory that we weren't aware of that was actually part of the history? We're making this assumption that the doctor shook his head sadness. And really on the inside he was jumping up and down saying, great, I want to get this guy out of the way. You know, not saying that that's true. But just saying, we don't know that it's not true, therefore should we assume that the other is? Anyway, so that's an interesting thing to think through. You have some historians who feel perfectly fine doing what they call reading against a source, as well as reading with the source. Reading with a source would be saying, the source says we ate pizza on this day. And so you write in, they ate pizza. Right? Reading against the source might be, no, wait a minute, Johnny was allergic to pizza. They had pizza that day, therefore maybe somebody had it in for Johnny. Right? I mean, could be true, maybe not. You're not sure. Um, so, so tell me, what do you do to really jazz up, enliven, enrich, make more exciting your historical writing? When you don't have all the details you wish you had, to tell, for example, a short story that you were writing creatively. So something that I try to do with mine a little bit is I try to add another character. Like a bird. Yeah, <laughs> like a bird. <laughs> he has um, birds in almost all of his short yeah. stories. <laughs> um, they, have, they have good perspective. They want yes, I, I, love, I love your birds. Yeah, um, but I try to add someone that I can kind of manipulate what's going on with that character, mm -hmm. but not necessarily change what's going on with the actual storyline. Mm -hmm. So adding the little details of a conversation or mm -hmm. stepping back and saying, wait, what about this? Like, and they have some kind of thing that they discuss through, but mm -hmm. it doesn't change actually the storyline, but you can change the perspective by adding another character that doesn't necessarily fit mm -hmm. into the actual history. So, I mean, it's quite obvious that there wasn't a bird that, right, I mean, sure. that I know of. <laughs> it was there, but it, you know, I've seen, I read a couple of history books that are similar where they add someone who's close, <laughs> who's close to, like, for instance, I read one of them, Paul Revere, where yeah. he had uh, an indentured servant from sure. his perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to add that kind of detail and make it interesting, but at mm -hmm. the same time stick true to what you know is factually true in history, it just kind of blends them both together in a way that you don't change things, but it adds the same perspective. So, Thank you for that. So a, a way to write historical fiction, perhaps, yeah. you know, and, and uh, balance those two things. I love that. Thank you. Um, please, Isaac. I think it probably depends on the scale that you're writing at. Like, you can't say, and then China dropped a bond on Japan, like, it's like no, that's not going to happen. Mm. But in a smaller, like on a much smaller scale, 
you can assume maybe this person hit this person where it could have just been a heated argument. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. On the, the scale of the, like, the history going back on either like a whole country or a little argument between two people. So yeah. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, please. So I think most of us have seen stories in the New Era or in the Friend magazine that are subtitled, or not subtitled, but in the byline or, or close to the title it says based on a true story. Right. right? right. And they're typically narrative stories, mm -hmm. stories that are short and they're true or they're true to the memories of this person. Mm -hmm. um, probably they have to be uh, you know, embellished just a little bit because they don't remember exactly what one character said, and yet to write it in the story of, or in the in the flavor of a narrative, they have to um, put in some dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think they they um, say based on a true story, and they write it as closely as they can to the story that they remember, mm -hmm. or they may modify it slightly and just acknowledge this is close to a true story. Sure. And I think I've done that myself as I've rewritten stories from when I was 10 and I didn't write it in my journal, but I remember the details sure, at some sure. level. I'm just writing it as closely as I can mm -hmm. to the things that I remember that were said and I'm sure that it's, I probably don't remember everything perfectly because my memory is, is mortal and, right. and human and faulty in some ways. Um, and so I, I might add a, a word, you know, some dialogue that's about what was said. I'm not quite sure if it's yeah. just right. I don't remember exactly what the sun looked like, but I'm going to try to describe that. It was a, an orange sunset, right? right? Probably orange. Maybe it was yellow. Right. I don't, or yellow. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love that comment. You know, I think it's interesting too sometimes just to always make sure that we are aware, um, even though we may have a record of people's actions, um, sometimes you'll see that we find far fewer records of people's, people's motivations. And even when we do have records of people motiv people's motivations, it's hard to understand my own motivation sometimes, let alone others. Uh, I mean, really. So, so, for example, even something as simple as, you know, as the regulars assaulted his position, well, maybe there was a record that talked about how this group of, of British soldiers left and started coming at him. Maybe they were running away. <laughs> maybe they were leaving the battle. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if you, you, you're putting things together here, and obviously some of them did attack him, so that there was a, you know, a line of logic that you could follow, but just remember, sometimes if you think about somebody who goes to accept an award um, and you have a picture of them accepting an award on you know, the rostrum, they're smiling for the camera, um, you might write the story and say, and they were so happy to receive the award. Maybe under their breath they were thinking, I hate being here, I'm so embarrassed, I wish I didn't receive this award, somebody else should have gotten it, you know? Um, but if we just go by the action, um, we might think otherwise. Um, you know, and so I, and I think that's always really important to remember when it comes to, to, to writing history. Uh, it's certainly hard to feel that we fully know somebody well enough um, to write about them when they didn't maybe fully understand their own actions sometimes. You know, because really, if I were to ask you today, um, you know, why did you do the second thing you did after you got up? I, you know, I, do you remember? I don't know, what was the second thing you did after you got up? Thinking, well, let's see. I have quite a routine. I shave first, and I brush my teeth. You know what I mean? I think, well, I, I think in the back of my mind I was thinking something like, it's good to brush your teeth because if you don't, they might rot. And that would be bad. You know, you, you, but yet, maybe that wasn't my motivation. Maybe I was just on autopilot. You know? And so these are interesting things to think about. So generally speaking, uh, tell me what you think of Paul Revere's ride, just from this one little excerpt. Generally favorable, generally not favorable. Why or why not? Caleb, you, you, you like it. You like it. You, you, would you read it? You think you, you might be interested in looking at the whole book? Oh, good. Well, well great. <laughs> Caleb has read it. Um, please. Sorry, I have one thing. Yeah. So I didn't raise my hand for either because I wasn't quite sure if it was a positive or negative. Sure, sure. Um, but one thing that he does here is he doesn't really bring out a principle <laughs> in this. So you can reason a principle that. This guy was determined, he mm -hmm. was convicted in his country, mm -hmm. and he believed in what he was fighting for. But at the same time, he doesn't really spell that out. All you see is this this, this guy went, and mm -hmm. he was a straw wig. Mm -hmm. That's all you really know. He mm -hmm. went and stood up against the soldiers and fought well. Mm -hmm. So 
part of this is you could say, well, depending on the audience, depending on how little mm -hmm. children are or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. they might not really understand the point of the story. Sure. But on the other hand, it might be something where it makes you think. Mm -hmm. And because they think, they then reason something, and then maybe something else mm -hmm. makes a connection too. So I wasn't really sure if it was a positive or a negative, sure. because it could go either way depending on the audience. But he makes you look for, yeah. for what the real motivations are. I, I like spell that. out everything for you. I, I, I like that a lot. You know, I heard, oh, please, you stepped like, oh, was it? No, I was just going to say, it is interesting because just the general feeling in the room, and once again, this is my assumption, it could be wrong. My assumption was that we looked at the story as a great example of a patriot standing firmly, stubbornly for his convictions in a very heroic way, you know? And like I said, that could be wrong. That's just my assumption. Uh, and so I think it is interesting because really, uh, what if others didn't see it that way? Um, now, I think there is perhaps he tips his hand a little bit at the very end where he does talk about how uh, the progeny of Whittemores who are tough today as tough and independent as the sturdy old rebel who stood alone against the British Brigade. And you're wondering, okay, in his mind, was he thinking we would assume that's what he was showing by painting this picture? But perhaps some might not make those assumptions. This is up to Please, and then Isaac. And we've got a microphone just, uh, just here. I think he tips his hand in the details he chooses to include. Mm -hmm. Because anyone reading this, regardless of their British background or their American leanings, regardless of that, here is an elderly gentleman who could have sat in his rocking chair and waved to the British as they went by. Exactly. We're evacuated with the women and children. But he was armed and ready for the fight at his ripe old age. Yes. That's a commentary. If we're mm -hmm. using him as representative of the American people, yeah. this is brilliant. And then the British, who blow away part of his jaw and then stab him 14 times seriously, yeah. it, it tells us a great deal about the nature of the Americans and the nature of the British, at least from this writer's point of view. Sure, sure. So in the detail that he included, right, you see where he leaves. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Isaac, please. So I can distinctly remember Mr. Cornell telling us a story in fifth grade. And um, I remember him telling us that he was, so he had all these guns and he was coming out of his front door and he was just waiting for, the, for them to come around the corner. And after, I'm pretty sure that Ms. Cornell said nine um, bayonet stabs by soldiers, but when they had shot through his jaw and then left him there, um, he scrambled to his house while looking for like a towel or bandana, and he tied his jaw to his head. And for the next hours, he was just trying to treat all of his wounds with his jaw tied to his head, just staying there. and. It was hard for him to breathe. He had to breathe through his nose and stuff. So, um, obviously, now it's like some pretty good detail, and this little story doesn't have as much detail. So I think, I think this was a good um, summary of what actually happened. Yeah. In that, in that incident. Thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, talking about uh, this deliberate narrative, right, he's trying to move it along fairly quickly. Right, or else he would have written a lot more details that would have shifted the focus. Because you'll see, this is just one small part of a much larger chapter about what happens at Miriam's Corner, Monotomy, the road all the way back to Boston, with the vicious fighting that occurred there, house to house, hand to hand. So last night I was reading a, a little bit of President Hinckley's biography by Sherry Dew, and I was impressed by her writing style. She described his leaving his mission and touring mm -hmm. through Europe and then his travels home to Salt Lake City and his excitement to see Marjorie. And there were enough quotes um, from his journals that it felt so credible mm -hmm. to me because she could weave in quotes from journals yes. or letters uh, or perhaps details from an interview with President mm -hmm. Hinckley who was living at the time when this biography was written. And so it felt so credible to me in part because of the direct quotations. Right. And I wondered, um, could you comment? Uh, as I look at this, I love what's written here, but I am personally hungry or thirsty sure. for 
footnotes or quotation marks right. that will, to me, at least lend some credibility. Sure. And maybe it's such a braided narrative that there would be two or three footnotes or endnotes for every sentence, right? right, like right. Maybe that's like overkill. Can you talk to that for a minute? Sure, sure. So just so you know, and, and I think they're all gone, uh, but I think that almost every one of these, of the, of the seven excerpts, I had extensive footnoting. Um, I removed those just for the ease of reading because I wasn't going to stick all the footnotes. And one of the reasons why is because, uh, especially in Fisher's book, he would have at times ten sources for you know one paragraph. And so rather than putting a footnote at the end of every sentence, if he was telling one story, at the end of that story, he would have a footnote that would then take you to, uh, well, actually in his case there were end notes, that was the publishing decision. Um, but Basically, they would take you to endnotes, and if you were to go to the endnotes, you would see that the endnote was this long. Because not only did it have a citation of sources, but it had even more information. If you look at this source, it actually has an account that I didn't have time to put in here, and here's another little story. You know, or actually, this one said that he had 13 of these. You know, and uh, this is under dispute, because if you compare this source to this source, two people said this, but one person said that. You know what I mean? And so there's even more there that you know, he's trying to keep the narrative crisp you know, and moving along. Um, so that's one thing that, that, that I can say that certainly, uh, in this case, a lot of what he did, um, if he found a particularly pungent quote that, you're, oh, you have to use his own words, um, he would use it. But in other instances, he would simply summarize based on a number of different first-hand accounts, as he did here. So you'll see there's, there's not a first percent. But yet, if you look, for example, uh, in source number four, you'll see that Bernard Balin uh, uses Dickinson's words specifically. Um, in fact, there, there's actually a time at the end where I feel like using Dickinson's words detracts a little bit from the flow of the writing, but yet the words are more powerful um, than perhaps the ones that he was thinking of, and he felt that the weight of those words from the original author would be more important than keeping the narrative flow. Anyway, so I don't know if that answers your question, but just a couple couple things there. Let me let me just, uh, one final question before we move on, because obviously we can talk about this source all day. Um, but what did this source tell you about the way Fisher views the purpose of history. What to Fisher would be the purpose of writing history? Because he has a very specific purpose. In fact, there are some people who completely disagree with this purpose. They don't like what he does, and they were angry when they won the Pulitzer Prize. Historians. What's his purpose? Because I can speak to his motivation because he told it to me many times and I asked him questions about it. So I, I can tell you a little bit about this one. What do you think, though? Please. I'm just guessing, but it seems he's trying to really make it interesting and make people want to know more history. Okay. And really put um, history as a fascinating mm -hmm. and drying subject. Oh, definitely. Certainly. Uh, one of his chief concerns is that people have stopped caring about the past. They stopped caring about their own past. And he firmly believes that there are lessons in our own past that we need to understand. And we're going to have a healthy nation today. Um, and, and with that said, one of the reasons why he not only tries to make this um, exciting, but also inspiring, is because he is firmly committed to writing books that are, number one, academic and, and respected you know, for their research and their writing and their erudition. I mean, there's a lot of intelligence in this um, and a lot of analysis, too. This one, maybe not as much as like, I just gave you one story. But he's also committed to showing some of our best selves to ourselves so that we can say we can act more nobly. We can act in the noble spirit of our forebears. Um, and that is actually one of the things that he is specifically trying to show. Um, and so, so I, I love that. Um, anyway, uh, that's just one thing. Do, do you agree that history should be inspiring? Is there ever a place for history to not be inspiring? Should history always teach lessons, or are there times when history should just be history? Because there's some historians, for example, the ones who don't like this type of history, they say, well, we just need history for history's sake. History shouldn't be trying to, quote unquote, push an agenda or make an argument a larger argument beyond its own immediate context. See, I disagree with that line of thinking simply because I think there's something you can learn from any story, even if it's not necessarily something that's inspiring, sure. even if it's a warning. There's okay. always something that you can learn, oh. and history is never, ever just history. Because, yeah, because it, history is the story of people and the choices they make, 
It's not just things that happened in the past. So whether or not we can be inspired and say, wow, that guy was a hero and stood up for what he believed in, or whether we could say, wow, that was awful and I don't ever want to do anything like that, mm -hmm. he, there's always something that you can learn. and There's never just history for the sake of history. Sure. Thank, thanks for that. Please, Isaac. I think history is like a big jump start and kind of like the only way that we can progress as human beings because if we were all, if we didn't know anything about history, we'd be going back to the way people lived a long time ago. And when we study history, we can get loads of information really quick and sure you have to get experience with some things and learn to learn certain lessons. But there's a lot that you can learn just from reading history. It'll give you so much more of uh, an advantage and head start yeah. in your life and just progressing um, history itself and for other people. Uh, thanks so much for that. Please? I also like the fact that he doesn't oh. like... Um, Sorry. I like the fact that he doesn't like... It sounds kind of strange, but he doesn't sugarcoat the event. Mm -hmm. In so many times, in so many cases, and especially where I, I was, I've always been in public schools and the way they tell stories, you don't hear about his jaw being blown mm -hmm. off. You don't hear about him being stabbed 14 mm -hmm. times and being left. You know, you right. hear about um, the the only the good things, mm -hmm. which is great. But then when you do hear something bad, it shocks you. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't really um, put in perspective his, like, heroic. Yeah. Oh, I love that comment. Thank you so much. By the way, happy to have you again. Thanks. So, I love that. I love that. Anyway, well, friends, so many great things to think about. Um, and then, as I said, um, as you write, maybe I know some of you have written yours already, but, but as you think about writing um, your paragraph or half a page or page or whatever it's going to be, um, you'll have maybe a few more things to think about in, in the choices you make uh, in, the, in your writing. Okay, let's take a look at the second one. This one's a really interesting book, but I, I think they're all interesting. <laughs> um, or else I wouldn't, I wouldn't own them. Um, but this is David Cohen. Uh, he's actually a, a British, uh, originally a South African journalist who, who wrote an interesting history, if you will, um, sort of history slash news reporting, but yet uh, the history tie-in is that he was uh, determined to retrace de Tocqueville's steps. De Tocqueville visited the United States in 1831 and 1832 um, and then wrote about his, uh, his travels and his observations. Uh, and his conclusions um, in Democracy in America, the, the, the English uh, translation of, of his title. Um, and uh, anyway, David Cohen basically found out, as, as near as he could, uh, the route that de Tocqueville took, and he now, you know, a few hundred years later, you know, a um, hundred and what, eighty, seventy years later or so, um, took the same journey. Anyway, he came to some different conclusions, though, because essentially he was saying if Tocqueville came back today, would he have said the same thing? That was kind of the premise he started from, it, and then he made these observations. This is from a particularly pessimistic chapter uh, where he feels that, and once again, I know I'm just getting an excerpt, so I'm giving you a little background. He feels that America's churches have failed um, in the, the mission that Tocqueville saw for them. Um, and he saw that they were to be this compassionate beacon as well as a source of comfort for America in terms of helping the poor and needy in voluntary ways. Um, and uh, essentially the whole book uh, it is perhaps uh, one that, that we may or may uh, not agree with uh, in terms of uh, its overarching argument. He, he's very, he very much has an agenda. He's very open about his agenda. And his agenda is simply, I want to show that America is not an equal place. Um, his whole point is to prove inequality uh, in the United States um, and how this would have disappointed Tocqueville, but also how it should disappoint us and how we should do more about it to, to try to help. And, and so just that there's a background for you. Okay? Uh, so let's just take a sentence each. You, of course, you can always pass if, you, if you're not feeling like reading for some reason. Uh, but I'll, I'll start. Today, inequality displaces equality as the norm. And by the way, the background to that sentence there is remember Tocqueville talked again and again and again and again about equality of condition, equality of condition, um, not meaning um, the communist sense of forcing people to be equal, uh, not abolishing private property, uh, but in the sense that he felt that equality of condition is what we have been calling equality of opportunity, that the conditions in America are so good that people really do have such a great chance to do well, 
that they really are, in a sense, lined up at the starting line together. And now it's up to them. They have an opportunity to run the race. How fast and how far they go will be up to them. Just you know, so that's the baggage of that sentence. Anyway, today inequality displaces equality as the norm, giving rise to opinions, feelings, and customs inimical to those experienced under equality. Against this very different sensibility and backdrop, the church in America faces a much tougher challenge. I read too. You can read too. <laughs> and a choice. Either it can retreat into self-contained layers of evangelism and religious, uh, religiosity, distancing itself from the social gospel, and leave business and government to address issues of social justice, if they so decide. Or it can come out of the slipstream of capitalism and help hear the white, heal the widening gap between the haves and the have-nots by actively advocating for political and social change. Which broad church is winning, t is winning this battle for the soul of America? Nationwide, it seems too close to call. But here in the South, there is no doubt that the co conservative um, perspective is dominant. To the extent that it succeeds in shifting the terms of engagement in the national political arena in Washington, D.C., to the extent that it infuses, shapes, and becomes dominant ideology in the U.S., that de Tocqueville um, would have had to admit um, would be the true tragedy of American confession. Okay, so go ahead uh, with your T-chart, reason positives, reason negatives, and then we'll come back and talk about it in a moment. And then you can look at both his approach in terms of his writing style, you can think about his philosophies about history and the writing of it, uh, you can look um, at uh, how he supported his arguments, uh, you can look also, at the arguments themselves, and, and you may agree or disagree. So go ahead and do all that reasoning. We'll come back together. Also, too, now that this is our second one, you may want to think about differences between the first and now the second. Which do you like better and why?
Another uh, 30 seconds and then we'll talk about your, your reasoning. Thank you. Please, this is Evelyn. When I read something like this, I have to ask myself, have they not read history? Do they not know that communism, socialism, democracy never works in the long run? You cannot force people to be the same. We are not the same. We all have different gifts and talents and abilities, and that doesn't mean to oppress everybody. But if you want to force everyone to the lowest level, that's what it will do. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and, and tell me, which um, lines give you that impression of, of his argument? Because I, I think this is this is a very important point. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Oh, to the extent that it succeeds in shifting in terms of, is it number two, David Cohen? Yes, yes. Uh, in shifting the terms of engagement in the national political arena in Washington, D.C., to the extent that it infuses shapes and becomes a dominant ideology in the, in the U.S., that, Tocqueville would have had to admit, would be the true tragedy of American compassion. I don't think... I don't think compassion means force. Mm -hmm. and, and when he says, uh, we have to help heal the widening gap mm -hmm. by actively advocating for political mm -hmm. and social... So political is always force. Politics always has laws, and they force, they have punishments, they have mm -hmm. ways to enforce sure. the laws. And so that, to me, is showing that he is a communist. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for that. And I think this is an interesting point, because really what you'll see is by the end of the book, uh, his conclusion is that American political engines... Um, whether it be through laws or other means, are not doing enough. And he feels that they don't do enough in part, whether this is one chapter, uh, but because churches don't ask the government to do enough. The churches don't care enough uh, to try to get the government to do more. He wants churches uh, to teach that their members should be activists for government solutions to social problems, as he sees them, like what he sees as the problem of inequality. Um, and so I think you definitely are right in terms of where he wants to go with all of this. Um, he feels, um, one of his main points is that he feels that churches absolutely, even if everybody was giving as they, as they could give, don't have enough firepower to help solve the problems as he feels they should be solved. That even if every one of us went out and gave as much as we possibly could give without hurting our own families, um, that that would never actually solve the amount of poverty and inequality that we actually have in the United States. And so he feels that compassion, uh, if it means charitable giving in a voluntary way, is going to be just sort of a pipe dream that sounds good but can't really solve the problems. Therefore, we have to have governments be involved. Just, you know, so, so you're definitely right in seeing where, you know, where he's coming from. And like I said, that's very good because you only have an excerpt, you know, because there's a lot more to it, of course. Please, Caleb. So, Kind of a point similar to that, and well, two points really. But well, where he says here, the church in America, not churches, but mm -hmm. he's basically grouping a huge, very right. widely. There are the religious people who go to church, yeah, church, and yeah. then there's everybody else. And he's grouping right. every, even every religion, all the different mm -hmm. kinds of mm -hmm. people, and all into one group. Um, so the church in America, 
faces a much tougher challenge and a choice either can retreat into self-contained layers of evangelism <coughs> and religiosity, distancing, distancing itself from the social gospel and leave business and government to address issues of social justice. Basically, in what he's saying, that really paints it as the negative choice. Sure. He's really saying this is what they're doing and it's not a good exactly. thing. What, what is he saying? And I think this is important. We'll make sure we're all on the same page. What does he have against churches? Other than that, they're not agitating for political and social change. In a way, that they're too churchy. Too churchy. And what does he mean by that? What, what is he saying they're doing instead of what he feels they should be doing? They're retreating into self-contained layers of religious religiosity and evangelism that is not what churches are. Yeah, they're not, they're not self-contained right. either. These are people that are saying, well, we have our little church, we're shutting the door, and this is where we're going to have <laughs> our... I, I wouldn't say that's the case at all. So he's painting a picture that really doesn't doesn't spring true to me. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, because for him, the issue is too much no, not enough do, right? That you're happy to talk about theological differences. And here's why my church is right. Here's why your church isn't as right as my church. Um, but you actually don't go and do what you should be doing, which is caring about the poor and the needy. I mean, that's, you know, one of the main points there. Yeah. Great, great job, please. So what I know if I know in this particular paragraph in particular is mm. that it's just mostly his opinion. Mm. It's not like giving any uh, historical background or references like he's saying the church is, uh, churches aren't giving, but he doesn't have like any examples or anything. Mm -hmm. And I know I guess there might be more examples in the book, but right here uh, I just think he's just kind of being pushy about his opinion. Okay, definitely. And I think you hit on the number of things. Number one, this book is, is, is not afraid to say, I have an agenda. I feel that inequality is wrong. I will write a book to give you anecdotal evidence as to why inequality is wrong. And so essentially what this book is, and I'm really glad you picked up on this, it's a series of interviews that or he's a journalist that he writes into an interesting, you know, readable, and then this, this part is a little bit more only opinion, but what you'll see is basically he'll go into a cafe in Detroit and he'll say, hey, tell me about life. You look like you're down on your luck. And they'll talk about, well, you know, the government stopped giving me this when this guy took office. and the government stopped giving me this when this guy took office. Well, this law has hurt us here. My great-grandfather, well, he didn't have anything either, you know, and that kind of a thing. Uh, and then he'll weave that story in a way that then supports his opinion. So this book is a very breezy travelogue. Um, in, in many senses, uh, that really is written as kind of an op-ed piece, right? Uh, this really is an editorial opinion that he stretched into a book uh, that is a fast read, that isn't as well documented. He does have some documentation, not, not here, but what you will see is that essentially this is something that you could pick up in an airport. You know what I mean? That you'd read on an airplane, that is kind of light reading, it doesn't really tax the brain too much but he's trying to get people to think about his point, you know? And we can say either we like that or we don't like that. I'm hearing that, that we don't like that as much. So let's compare, um, or maybe let's do this. Versus, before we get to Fisher and compare him to Cohen, um, where does this fall short, if it does, with your standards of what history and the writing of history should be? Do you feel betrayed? Do you feel like you don't trust this as much? Do you not like it? Or do you feel like, no, this is one way to do it? Maybe I don't agree with this way, but it's fine. He doesn't have any mm -hmm. proof, and he implicates, and what he said, out of the slipstream of capitalism, as if capitalism is a major problem. Mm -hmm. And yet capitalism is what brought people to higher levels and took them out of the slums. It's only when we start getting government involved that they all got pushed back in again. So that's the thing. So certainly this book is not backing down from being overtly political uh, by attacking uh, one of the hallmarks of the American economic system, capitalism. Um, and trying to show capitalism leads to the widening gap of inequality. And he doesn't want the gap. Sure. Sure. Thank you for that. Well, Caleb and then Isaac. To me, the only real references of history in this are referencing Tocqueville and not a quote from him, but saying, well, if he were here, he would have mm -hmm. to agree with this. Mm -hmm. He really, this isn't really commenting on history and giving a contrast. It's just right. saying this is how things are today. Sure. And that's different from before. Sure. How? He doesn't spell out how. He doesn't give you any examples. Even de Tocqueville's quotes from before about how what he saw in America, he doesn't compare at all. This is all his just commentary on what he sees today right. as. 
Sure. Now, that's important, right? Notice, this is something that happens often um, by, by many people on all sides. Um, this is using a historical figure who has authoritative weight and putting him in your camp. You know, uh, it's a presentist view of the past. Um, and it's one that, as you said, doesn't seem to be terribly historical. But yet he's invoking the name of Tocqueville as an ally, whether or not he would have been. Yeah. Sir, it kind of, it kind of reminds me of someone who would take a, a paper and then like a page mm. and take a, a bunch of different quotes, but like use a certain phrase and then dot, 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 and then another mm -hmm. phrase, dot, 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 mm -hmm. just to mold it into what he wants mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. And also like, it's very like bias, I guess, or his personal opinion. And like given all these different things are part of his opinion than this, instead of seeing it, seeing it in like a general way, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Sure, sure. You bring up a really interesting word. The word is bias. Um, do we feel that historians should strive to write as objectively as possible, or should they allow their biases to be known and to write with those firmly in mind? To say, this is who I am, this is how I'm writing, and you can take it or leave it. But just so you know, I'm not going to try to hide the ball, I'm not going to try to pretend that I'm you know, this objective observer who is, you know, making these just dispassionate conclusions. What do you think? Because that's a huge debate among historians. I think it depends on what you're writing for. Mm -hmm. If you're writing a curriculum, then I would say, no, you should not be putting your bias and you need to let people think. You need to say, here's the facts that I do have. Okay. And here's how this side sees it and here's how this side sees it. Okay. What do you think? And I think part of the way we have... Uh, Part of what I've seen is the way you've written this curriculum. You haven't focused completely on, well, here's, this is amazing, this is the conservative line, even though that's where you're leaning towards, but we go over the, the New Deal and extend and extend and say, what were his motives? What were, what were the good things from this? What was he trying to do? So in personal things, I could say, yeah, I, this is how I feel. This is what I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, if, if this convinces you to my side, then yeah, but I'm not trying to, to, sugarcoat my opinion for both sides. Mm -hmm. When you're writing for something like a curriculum, mm -hmm. I think it's it's really, you have to be careful with what you're trying to do because both sides could use it. And if you agree, it's great. But if you don't, then you're saying, wait, they're rewriting history. Mm -hmm. So I think when you're being more broad, depending on who you're talking to, it might be wise to be more objective. Mm -hmm. But if you have a specific point that you feel that you need to make or that you're writing for something to say, this is what I believe, then by all means, write what you believe. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. Was that a hand, Brenna? Yeah. Brenna, and then Camilla. Okay. Uh, kind of going off what Caleb should say. Um, I think that historians or people who write these can have a bias, but they I don't think they should be dishonest about it because some historians maybe leave out things that would counteract their opinion but are very important to the history. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I'm thinking of our lessons, uh, especially our African-American history, during unit, like, um, it was good that the that the African Americans got freedom, and that's really good. I mean, that's our opinion, but it also did give the federal government more power. So, yeah, just something like that. Thanks, thanks, Brenda. Thanks for that. Please. Um, it just reminds me of my speech and debate teacher. He he'll never share with us his opinion, and whenever we're having a discussion about an opinion, he makes sure to argue both sides mm -hmm. so that it forces you to like give yourself an opinion and then like argue that opinion and then if you find flaws in that opinion you can like build it up in a in a way that it's it's your opinion and right. it's not based off someone who you think has more experience than you and so it just really makes you think about your opinion if you're accurate and create your own position yeah. on that opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Please. And I think there definitely is a place to teach children to think and be logical. Mm -hmm. But I guess I kind of disagree because I think that's the purpose of the American Heritage School. We are teaching our philosophy. I want my children to be kind of Christian perspective, an LDS perspective even. I want them to understand true principles of freedom as established by the founding fathers. I, I find it impossible for anyone to be vanilla about any topic because we all have passionate feelings about something mm -hmm. as critical and as basic as agency. Sure. Because that was the whole purpose of of the battle in the premortal life, and I think it's still the purpose here. And I think we have to keep that in mind, and we have to keep our 
um, perspective honest with themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't know that any person can just be completely blasé mm -hmm. and just state facts. Mm -hmm. I don't think that would accomplish a whole lot. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I love that. Love that. And just you know, this is this is a topic that has been debated and written about um, for hundreds of years when it comes to history. Um, this this one book, if you're if you're interested in this in this topic, um, it's by Peter Novak. It's called That Noble Dream. Um, it's about what uh, Novak calls the objectivity question uh, in writing history. Um, just a really interesting read. Um, not that you necessarily, it, it's called That Noble Dream by Peter Novak, uh, N-O-V-A-K. Um, anyway, ju just a really very thoughtful look um, at uh, this idea of, of objectivity. Um, anyway, we need to take a break. I, I Honestly, we could be going for hours. And, um, so let's take a break for anybody who might need to use the bathroom. Or, or just want to stretch legs or anything like that. Um, and we'll just come back in, in five minutes, all right? But thank you so much. I, I love these thoughts. And please, once again, um, there's so much richness here. Can I invite you to continue these conversations at dinner with your families? Um, I just think we're wild. You're like, hey, mom, let's think about objectivity. You know? Uh, <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Would that be pretty wild at your home? Yeah. Oh, what are they? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, let, we'll take a break. Um, I love you all. I love what you're sharing. And really, I'm excited about these conversations. I think they're wonderful. And uh, do you see what I mean when I said I'm really excited about today's class? There, this is, anyway, this is incredibly important, the writing of history um, and how we do it and the purposeful choices we make. Um, so we'll take a break before I keep going. So. Great. Welcome back, friends. We've had our little break, and, and uh, we talked mostly through the break about, about the same questions we've been uh, discussing, and I just think it's wonderful. You know, that, that, that's what I, I always uh, just feel so excited, because I, I had professors um, in, in college, and one of the things I loved most, of course, I loved the, you know, the, the lectures, and I, I took pages and pages of notes, I, I, and I, I had saved every one of my notebooks um, from college, because, I mean, I worked that hard and made that record, and I love, you know, um, what, I, what I learned. Um, but uh, even more than in class, I would absolutely love those moments after class where I would just get into a conversation with the professor and we would talk and there were times when we would talk and we'd end up walking back to his office and keep talking for another hour about something in the class that had really caught you know, my attention. And, um, and I would love it because the professor you know, would say something like, you know, most students don't even care. They don't want to learn more. They don't want to talk about this. I said, no, no, this is great, you know, and, and, and that just built these great bonds. So I, I have some of the happiest memories of not just what we did in class, but what we did outside of class. And, and I'll never forget, I had a professor, um, and uh, he said once, you know, um, I'm so sad when I end class. <coughs> oh, bless you. Sorry. Uh, when I end class and when... Um, Students just get up and start talking about who they're going to go on a date with that night or who, uh, you know, the football team is playing. And you realize, wow, this didn't really change them. You know, that this didn't seem to sink in, you know. Um, and that, anyway, that's why I just, I always invite, uh, I'm, I'm sure some lessons speak, you know, to each of you maybe more than others. Um, but I just feel so um, determined um, in, in my belief that some of the things that we're talking about today are really important I and mean, really, you know, um, and it has so much to do with the way we we live, the way we make memories together, uh, the way we are part of communities, uh, in our families, in our wards. I mean, the stories that we tell and how we tell them um, have everything to do um, with the way we form a collective memory that then is part of who we are. You know, what we stand for, what we choose to fight for, what we keep silent about versus what we're willing to risk everything for. You know, because my guess is that if somebody came in this room right now, you know, and said something to the effect of, um, you know, I have a weapon, I'm not afraid to use it, um, you'll be safe if you simply deny that Jesus is the Christ. Um, my guess is that there would be many in this room, um, if not all, who would say, do what you will. Um, I cannot, I will not deny my Savior. Um, and that has come because people bother to tell stories, true stories. Think of the Bible. Think of the record we have. Think of the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and stories from church history. I mean, 
these testimonies that we have burning brightly come because we have read history. Um, and I just want to testify that I absolutely love history. I always have. I can't imagine not loving it. Um, it's been a part of me ever since I was a boy. I, I remember I would just go into the woods of New Hampshire, and I would climb trees, and I would look out, and I would try to imagine what life had been like. Because for me, I'm thinking, how can I understand who I am today if I don't know where I've come from? And so I would read everything I could. I read so little fiction when I was young because I was constantly reading nonfiction. I loved history. Every, I, I, and I, when I, I remember being five years old and reading books about the War of 1812 and just my parents think, what can we get for Christmas? Buy me a few more books about this. Buy me some books about that. You know. Um, anyway, all I'm saying is these things matter very much. Um, and, and my hope is that you, you get that sense, that you can feel that. Uh, anyway, so there's my little plug for, for why we're doing this today, uh, talking about the writing of history. You know, of course, we don't have time to do all the rest of these, um, but uh, would you go ahead and, and just uh, scan at least the titles, and you may want to read a little bit into the excerpts. Would you tell me one that you would love to, to look at next? Because like I said, I don't think we'll have time, and I don't want to rush. I don't want to rush uh, doing this the right way. I don't think reasoning and relating can, can be rushed if, if you want to do it uh, well. So. Um, what's one that really uh, is one you don't want to miss before our time is up today? <laughs> it is. <laughs> that one has some really great lessons. Do you want to look at that one? I, <laughs> let's look at number three. Okay, ready? Okay, so this is Joseph Conlon. This is a survey textbook. This is a tertiary source. Um, it's not a primary source, meaning it's not written by an eyewitness of the event. Uh, it's not a secondary source. It, it's not a monograph about you know, one particular subject uh, using primary sources to then come and make conclusions and then write a story. This is a source that uh, its purpose is to give students, college students, just so you know, college-age students information about American history in a survey level course, where essentially you're not diving terribly deeply but yet you're hitting the tops of a lot of mountains. That's kind of the, the purpose of, of, of this, this book. Uh, and, and I love this. Well, I actually don't love this. Uh, but I love thinking about how much there is to say about this. <laughs> and I tell you, I actually collect books um, that uh, provide little snippets about um, the LDS Church. Because I actually like reading them and laughing. Because they are so wildly unique and creative in the way they have come to the story of our people. So, anyway, um, so, so let's read this together, okay? I, I will, uh, I'll start here. Joseph Smith was a daydreaming part-time treasure hunter who, on a countryside ramble when he was 20, met an angel Morona. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I just, I just laugh, I laugh and laugh and laugh. Anyway, but the, the countryside ramble, <laughs> we have so many, this is where you're like, we have so many accounts of where these meetings happen. I'm thinking, anyway, so sorry. I, I, I don't want to ruin this here, but okay, go, keep going. Moroni showed him gold plates bearing mysterious inscription, inscriptions that with the help of miraculous stones, Smith was able to read. In 1830, with his family and some neighbors already convinced, Smith published, published his translation of the Reformed Egyptian as the Book of Mormon, a Bible of the, new, of the New World. It told the Nephite, Nephites, descendants of lost tribes of Israel, who had come to America, whom Christ visited, and their enemies, the Lamanites, the Indians. The book lacked the poetry and substance of the Bible. If you put over it, it as if you, okay, there we go. If you put over it as millions have studied the Bible. Mark Twain called the Book of Mormon chloroform in print, saying that the phrase and it came to pass appeared two thousand times. This one, this is the one that I think I'm not, I don't just laugh at this one, I almost cry 
because of how wrong this is. I'm sorry, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that. Um, Smith himself lost interest in his book within a few years. <laughs> when? How? He died for the book. He died reading the book. He was reading ether. Anyway, anyway, so, okay. At first, his religion was Protestant Christianity with a Native American gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> However, Smith's re revelations increasingly took the Mormons beyond Christian doctrinal boundaries. Proxy, baptiz proxy baptism, for example, Mormons saving ancestors who died before Smith's Latter-day revelations by being baptized in their place was an entirely original concept. He hasn't read the Bible, and he hasn't read Catholic history because baptisms for the dead are being performed hundreds of years after Christ died, and there had to be an edict to stop them. Really? Yes. <laughs> anyway, but that's okay. Um, so, so, so maybe we don't need to do the chart. Uh, okay, let, let's share your thoughts. I'd love to hear your reasoning about this because this was really interesting. Yes. <laughs> um. Just like what we're laughing about, he doesn't have any sources. He doesn't obviously have a good knowledge of of our religion and of Joseph Smith. To where where can you put these like opinions in a passionate way when he doesn't even know the doctrine or doesn't even know the religion? And obviously, he doesn't know the religion. Saying that Joseph Smith lost interest in the book when he, like you said, died for the book. It yeah. just makes sense. Thank you for that. I mean, right, and, and, thank you for that. And, and that, when here, this is where it's, this isn't like a blog post, you know, like this, somebody got up one morning and they're like, yeah, let me attack the Mormons today. This is a published work that is studied in colleges. This has a wide circulation. It was published by a big press and has had, it is in its ninth edition now, just so you know. It's ninth edition. So, please. Um, I can imagine like a ten-year-old looking at a car and like describing the engine to a person, and just all that he doesn't know, but trying to assume just by looking at the outside of the car, not even knowing what's inside of it, just trying to assume based on how fast it is or where it's going. Anyway. Yes, thank you for that. Please. I also think it's a really interesting like uh, stance, like viewpoint yeah. of. If these are the best ways he could bash our church, our church must be pretty awesome considering he was bashing our church in ways that don't necessarily even exist in doctrine. So, yeah. I don't know. yeah, thank you for that. I mean, this is really interesting. No, no, I think if we step back to just going back to the circulation of this book and then these great comments, um, one of the things we have to keep in mind is this may be how many people are introduced to our church. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, they're in a college course. Maybe they've never known a Mormon, or maybe not known a Mormon well. Maybe they haven't read too much or watched the news, and they're thinking, oh, Mormonism. Now, now wait, they, ha they I don't know much about them. You know, they maybe have some assumptions and heard some things. Um, but yet, in a college class where their grade's on the line, and this could be in a quiz, you know, could be on the final exam. They have to write a paper based on part of this chapter. Um, this is their introduction to what happens to be our faith. Now, this is interesting because... If the shoe is on the other foot, boy, what's the lesson here in writing about other people's faiths? What, what's the lesson? Right? I mean, for us, right? What do we need to be really careful about? Yeah. It makes me think about um, the books write, um, written about Native American history or just other churches around um, or basically anything. When it's um, broadened so much that I mean it's just hard because there's so much that we don't know and we try and learn about everything by generalizing it to an extreme point and really we're kind of jeopardizing a lot of knowledge instead of diving deep into certain spots because we're just getting little snippets that could be true or could not be true because they aren't tied to an actual source right right yeah, I mean, just imagine writing an essay about Mormons um, from this book, and you're in college and somewhere in Alabama or wherever, you know, um, and uh, you're like, yeah, yeah, Mormons, what a strange religion. I mean, the guy who wrote the book himself lost interest in it. What a joke. Right? But yet, nothing could be farther from the truth, you know, when you actually learn the truth. Um, and so can I just say, this is an invitation because I feel so strongly about this. Um, if we ever um, have the opportunity to write about someone different from ourselves, 
I hope we put in the due diligence to do the best we can to represent them fairly and in a way that they would feel comfortable with. Doesn't mean we disagree, or sorry, doesn't mean we agree with everything, right? Maybe we still disagree. Say, oh, you know, hey, I, you know, you know I don't believe that way, but certainly I will present you in a way that I would want to be presented, right? Not with misinformation, not with, I mean, and I, and I think, it, and by the way, once again, this is just an excerpt. Um, it gets downright mean if this isn't mean. Uh, and you're thinking, wait, why, why is that okay? But yet you write about other groups in your book, and, uh, and they were shiny examples of, you know, this, that, and the other that are all favorable. But yet, when there's a minority religious group that it appears, safe to say, he doesn't like uh, in some way, um, it's okay to just dismiss them, you know, as, as, as frauds. Yeah. I think it's, it's telling, too, that either, there's the, for someone who is of our faith, it's either he doesn't like us or he doesn't care. Mm -hmm. And it's, like you said, if you're going to write about someone else, how much does that make you think before you do? Because mm -hmm. not only do you want to present them in the way that you want to be presented, but you want to show that you put forth the effort. Mm -hmm. You aren't just saying, well, this is what I know, right. and putting it down. You actually tried. You put forth the effort to find out and find these sources and be accurate right. about it. Because really, if you put yeah. forth that, if you put forth that effort, I mean, it doesn't show because where he went wasn't the correct sources, obviously. So. Yeah. yeah. Because of all these inaccuracies, what are you led to assume about him as a historian, Leah and then Isaac? Just like Cambria said, like he hasn't looked enough into the history of our religion, and then like also other religions, like the Bible and. Um, just other things to know and to assume that these things happened um, with um, the, sorry, really quick. Um, oh, I lost oh, that he lost interest in the book. Like, where does it say that? Or mm -hmm. where does it right. even mention that? It, yeah, anyway, like he died for that reading it. Like right before. Anyway, it's just interesting. Yeah. Right. You received revelations that sent missionaries throughout the world with this book in hand as their message. Um, some of the early missionaries, you know, they didn't have preached my gospel. You know. Uh, by the way, this is a little aside. I, I once had a, a student uh, who said, now, "When did you serve a mission?" I said, oh, "I served, you know, 2000." He said, "Oh, did I preach my gospel?" I said, "Oh no, that was before preaching." I said, "Wow, that, that was before they taught by the Spirit, right?" Oh, <laughs> well. Uh, we, we, we tried to teach oh, by the Spirit. We, we, we didn't have preached by the Spirit, but we still had the Spirit. <laughs> I think people have been teaching by it from Adam to the present. Uh, you know, but anyway, that was just a cute little aside. Anyway, uh, but think of it. They didn't have formal um, curriculum. You know, they had the School of the Prophets, and that was a way that they would educate missionaries. Um, but yet, really, there were many times where Joseph would say, the Book of Mormon is your text. I mean, this is what we're here to preach. Um, of course, the Bible too, but especially this message of the restoration in, in the Book of Mormon. Anyway, um, so please, Isaac. I think this is an especially sensitive uh, topic too, just because we all have testimonies of this. Sure. We know that's true, and right. we know that this life is a lot more than just going through this earth and just learning things. It's about eternity. Mm -hmm. And when someone just kind of writes something off that's really, that's the deepest, in the deepest mm -hmm. section of our heart, it's hard to grasp because that's something so true to us and then someone's just saying, oh, he's just some treasure hunter who doesn't know what he's doing, you know? Yeah, so. I think you really, it hurts, right? It, oh, I think he died. It was, it was so offended, it, it just it stopped working. <laughs> Take it anyway, I, I was, we can pass it back, please. No, really, I mean, this, it hurts, you know, it really, really does hurt. Um, and, and I think, too, um, the more, and this is just this is my, my personal feeling about the Prophet Joseph, um, it would be hard for me to imagine anyone who spent the time necessary to really get to know the Prophet who wouldn't love him and be hurt by these words, whether or not they want to be members of the church. Um, I, I know many non-member historians um, who speak with much more respect about Joseph 
Um, one of them, for example, is Jan Ships, uh, not a member of the church, uh, but has written many, many, in fact, her life's work really has, has been Mormonism. Um, and uh, not a member of the church, but a friend to the church, and one, you know, who said, listen, these people who dismiss Joseph as a fraud, uh, they just don't know the history. Um, they just don't know what he went through and how sincere he was and how, you know, I, you know, saying I couldn't imagine how somebody could do what he did over a lie. Um, and this is someone who's not trying to make the church look good. You know, it's not in her best interest, you know. Um, she's just trying to be true to sources that she's read for her whole life. Um, and so that's just something that, you know, as you think about the many opportunities that we have to study these days, it's such a beautiful age. Um, we have the Joseph Smith Papers Project, which is so amazing. Um, and if you haven't been there yet, please go to josephsmithpapers.org. This website put out by the church, and you'll find thousands and thousands and thousands of documents. You'll find images, digitized images of the documents themselves, as well as transcriptions of the documents that you can go and research on your own. Uh, I don't know if anybody caught um, Elder Main's devotional the Worldwide Devotional for Young Adults on Sunday. And he talked about the First Vision accounts, and he specifically focused on Joseph's four First Vision accounts. He also talked a little bit briefly about the five other um, accounts that Joseph gave to others, and then they wrote about them later. But he talked about those uh, four specifically. And uh, anyway, just what a powerful example of using the resources we have to get to know the Prophet Joseph. So love that. Um, anyway, um, what's the takeaway for you, Brenna, as, as you think about... Um, this uh, third source. What's a lesson that you want to make sure you remember based on our conversations and our reasoning and relating? Uh, don't believe what you read all the time. I mean, you have to be very, very careful because uh, you don't know if someone's lying. You want to make sure that what you're reading is a, a reliable source. You know, maybe see where they got the information. Mm -hmm. For that. Anybody else? Something we haven't mentioned yet as a take home for you? Please, Isaac. Oh, okay. Please, uh, I don't know. Just with this specific column right here, I think it's really important because we all feel like this, um, like we've all been offended by what this specific person wrote. So I think it's a really good like time to put into check on what we say about other religions mm -hmm. and how we respect other people and their beliefs and to do it in a respectful and loving manner, not a forceful and aggressive and offensive manner. Cool. I love this idea of um, disagreeing without being disagreeable, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And don't discredit yourself. Whoops. Don't discredit yourself by spouting off things that you haven't really research and found out whether they're true or not because it really puts up a lot. I mean, I would never want to read anything else that he's written because I don't trust him anymore. He's completely off the wall. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Have you found it, my friend? Mm -hmm. okay. No worries. <laughs> um, yeah. That is really important. You know, are you writing in a way that people could trust you? Right? Or are you creating trust issues? You know? Um, you know, can I just say, I, I think it's so, so interesting to me. Uh, and obviously there, there are seven of these, and you are know, only looking at the third one, and that's okay. Um, but, but I think it is interesting. You think about learning by the Spirit. Um, there is something to the way the Spirit can teach you, even when you're exposed to something that's false. Because for me, and I don't, I don't know about for you, but... I think, I mean, I, I loved both of the discussions that we had previously. I think they were very important discussions. Um, but for some reason, um, the Spirit has spoken so clearly to my heart, um, as we talked about number three, um, and the witnesses that Joseph Smith really was a prophet of God, um, that he really stood in Carthage jail with his hands against the door, along with his brother, um, as that mob came up the stairs, um, that he really watched um, as that bullet went through the door um, and tore into the left nostril um, of Hiram's face as he exclaimed, Joseph, I'm a dead man, um, as he fell to the floor and as Joseph held him in his arms. Um, and you think, wow, in that moment, um, why didn't he just call it off? You know, if it really was just this fraud, 
Um, but there are so many experiences again and again and again um, that to Joseph as well as to us help us to know that Joseph Smith really was the prophet of the restoration. You know, and I've often thought to myself, you know, would, would I be able to do what he did? Um, you know, would, would I know that there were people pounding up the wooden stairs with guns trying to kill him? And he could see them outside the window before they came in. He knew what they were up to. Um, but yet, in that moment, he stood firm. Um, and, you know, I would like to say 100% yes. You know, um, I can't think of any reason why I wouldn't want to stand firm. Um, but of course, we haven't been in that moment yet in our life. I'm just imagining. I don't know what situations you've been in, but just gonna guess. Um, but can I just make an invitation that to every one of us today, that we think about how Joseph, as John Taylor testified, as well as Hiram, really did seal their testimonies with their blood. And and then would we be willing to do the same? Um, I think maybe an even more important question though is. Sometimes we talk a lot about, would you be willing to die for your testimony in the Book of Mormon, right? Um, but are we willing to live for it? You know, today, tonight, tomorrow, for the next 50 years, you know, are we willing to live every day the best we can and repent quickly if it's needed to show that we know that this book is true? And uh, anyway, that's my, my invitation that uh, we think about living that way. Please. Okay, so we were talking about um, like kind of the lack of respect that he had or just not doing his research. And you asked a question kind of along the lines of um, how should you um, undertake your education or how do you find um, like true knowledge. And you shared this quote on a slide earlier this year, and it's by J. Ruben Clark. Um, he who invades the domain of knowledge must approach it as Moses came to the burning bush. He stands on holy ground. He could acquire things sacred. I think that's important because when we're seeking to learn things, we need to be, like all knowledge is from God and all light and truth is from Holy Father. And through the Spirit, we can learn anything and we can reason and discern the right and wrong from things. So when we seek to be learning new um, new ideas that we haven't studied before, we especially need the Spirit to guide us and treat it as sacred knowledge that, and not something that you just throw in the back of your head and hope you remember it. I love that. Oh, thank you so much for that. All right. Um, well, my, my hope is that, that we've had a few things to think about today in the way that we come at writing history. Um, Let's go. I'd love to go around the room. I'll give us a, just a moment to think first. Um, as you think about the three conversations that we had today, or perhaps impressions that you had that weren't even maybe part of the conversation, but yet something important to you, what is one thing that you'd like to do either differently or to make sure that you keep doing it if you have been doing it when it comes to writing history? Because as some of you have, right, the last writing assignment for this course was kind of the reason why we're you know, doing this. Um, you, you may choose to do the analytical writing assignment, which is the last assignment before our final exam, which will be in two weeks. And next week, I'll we'll, uh, be looking at the whole course from, from beginning to end. We'll look at all the different topics. We'll go back and uh, hit some of the highlights and uh, reason and relate some of the best of the best um, from our course. And I'm really excited for that to go all the way from our Restored Gospel Foundations, um, and then to go to American religious history, American political history, American military history, American cultural history, Native American history, and finally our last unit, African American history, and go back and say, wow, what did we learn? What did we feel? What really meant something to us? What do we want to carry with us um, as uh, life lessons and principles that we just want to hold dear? You know, so I'm really excited about next week. Um, as, as well. But before we end today's class, I would love to know what you feel God would have you remember as you move forward, thinking about writing history in a way that would be pleasing to him. So go ahead, take a moment, think about it. What have you learned that you really passionately for yourself now want to make sure you do, or 
on the flip side, which you really want to make sure that you don't do when you write about the past. I'd invite everybody to share something if you like, but of course you don't need to. It's up to you. Um, I think it's important to remember um, that even when, even when it's like, like sometimes in a school setting or something, you don't want to include anything about your religion. You like you don't want to seem like you have like a an opinion about like how how you you, you don't want to have like a like how you view history. Um, but like to always make sure that even if it, if it, if you even if it's like a situation where it's not the norm to like share things about your religion, that um, you need to remember that the like um, a bunch of the teachers here at American Heritage have like in their classroom his story instead of history. Yeah. Um, but just to remember that like the reason why we're studying history is, is to like learn more of him and um, that to make sure you always stand up for what you believe. Thank you so much. Leah. So just from this last one that we've talked about, um, really getting to know um, as much as you can about a topic before you go writing about it yeah. because, um, like we said, it could offend someone or just do harm and stuff. And just not looking at one topic but looking at like many, many topics on that one thing so you can get... Um, all sides and share different sides and then also you can share a little bit of your personal opinion if it's um, the right time. Um, I think that's mainly what I would use. <laughs> yes, oh, love that. Thank you. Who's next? If you'd like to share, of course. Yeah. Brenna, please. Um, I think writing is really a way to connect with people and you can do a lot of good with it. Because I'm sure we've all read a really good book where we just, you know, feel maybe super passionate about it. We feel like we connect with the characters or some or the stories. And so, yeah, I just, we have to remember when we're writing uh, to be considerate about that and just think of, hmm, what can I do with this that can help others? Thank you. I love that. Isaac. So two words come to mind. And those are honesty and humility. And you don't want you don't want to make up a story. You don't want to try and um, yeah. So yeah, there's the humility part. So you don't want to make the story what it's not, or try and disguise it in any way, or hide certain parts. And also, you don't want to be telling a story to try and like what you said, promote yourself, or try and get more status, or try and prove your own opinion, you have to teach it the way the way it is, and the good and the bad, and just exactly what happened, I guess. Thank you, Thank you for that. Um, know your audience and their views religiously or um, politically in any way, and yeah. respect it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Why do you say have integrity? Thank you so much, friend. Um, you know, friends, I, I really I love that you shared. I love all the comments. Um, and I want to kind of tie our last conversation for number three back to number one with David Hackett Fisher. I know I've shared this um, before. You may remember it, you may not. Um, and, that, and that's okay. But speaking of integrity, um, David Hackett Fisher is, is somebody who, who I feel really does have that kind of integrity. Uh, as, as you may remember, as, as, I, as I've said before, he's not a member of our church um, and uh, certainly uh, you know, didn't go out of his way to make Mormons look better than they were, but I never once heard him say anything that was ignorant or mean-spirited. There was always a great respect. In fact, um, I took a number of classes from him when I was in graduate school in, in the Boston area. And 
Um, I'll never forget the day when we had come to uh, the early 1800s. Uh, we were talking about a lot of different changes. We were talking about the Second Great Awakening. In fact, we had read a number of books for that day because we would always come to class having read uh, at least two full books. Um, and then he would give us about 10 others that we were supposed to skim for each class. Um, so, and then there's thousands of pages, you know. And uh, anyway, you just tried to do the best you could. And, I mean, it was impossible to read every page. I mean, you had to just read for argument and try to figure out, okay, some, some main uh, supporting details. Anyway, that was a, a skill in itself that we could talk about another time. But um, it was interesting because we came to that day. And, um, I felt that he had a good lecture, you know, very interesting. And brought in a lot of different sources. And I felt like he was very even-handed, very fair, very respectful. Um, and then uh, we had about, you know, 20 minutes left because we'd, we'd eat for three hours at a time. Um, and uh, he said, now, you know, we have a special opportunity here today. Um, and by the way, the class was just like this. I mean, we even had fewer students. Um, there were five of us. Five of us and him. So um, he said, we have a special opportunity today because we're talking about the Second Great Awakening. Um, and we have someone here who I know personally um, has been deeply affected um, by some of the doctrines that came from that awakening um, in the Mormon church. Um, Nick, would you feel, that's my first name, Nick, would you feel comfortable sharing um, some of the beliefs that you care about the most when it comes to your church? Uh, because you are living history. You are a living example. Uh, you are a product, um, in part, of this religion that was restored um, as Joseph Smith himself said, it was restored. And I think he was respectful enough to know that versus, yeah, it was created as some gimmick, you know, okay, um, with a Native American gimmick, you know. Uh, but no, but he said, uh, tell us some of those, those truths that you hold dear in your religious tradition. Um, I think that would be much more helpful than me trying to summarize your beliefs. Um, and I had time to just address my colleagues. And I talked with them about before we got to lunch together, and they knew I was LDS, and we talked about different things. But I was able to talk about the history of our church. Um, and I was able to talk about, in fact, in that class, since people were really serious students, I said, one of the things I love um, is something that actually came from um, a revelation that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to the prophet Joseph Smith. Um, and it actually talks about how the knowledge that we gain here will rise with us in the resurrection. Um, and what a powerful and important quest it is in my life as a member of the church to gain true knowledge. Um, and I love that about my religion. I love how it embraces getting all the education that you can. As one of our more modern prophets, President Gordon B. Hinckley, has said. Um, anyway, and uh, and we had got to talk, and I, they asked me questions, and Dr. Fisher asked questions. And, um, it was just so respectful. Here is someone who had won the Pulitzer Prize, um, who had won a number of other awards, incredibly famous, you know, wealthy because of his success, his writing, I mean, sought-after speaker, uh, here, there, and everywhere, and he allowed me to speak about my religion. Um, that made a huge impression on me, not only um, on how to teach history and to try to let people speak for themselves about their beliefs, and one way we can do that is by including primary sources and quoting those versus just giving our take. I mean, certainly there's nothing here from Joseph's lips about his lack of interest in the Book of Mormon, right? Um, but yet, um, on the other hand, I also gained such respect for Dr. Fisher as a person. And I realized, you know, I would hope that people not of my faith would say, oh, he's a man of integrity. I really admire and respect the way he writes about the past. Um, and that is a lesson that I don't think I'll ever forget. You know, once again, you think about um, our opportunity to, as Brenda was saying, affect people's lives for the better by what we write. Um, I hope that we look at the writing of the past, historiography, as a, not only a privilege, but a sacred responsibility. And as we write in the future, I hope that something from this lesson may come back to us by the Spirit so that we will be a little kinder, a little less ignorant, a little more respectful, a little more thoughtful, a little more knowledgeable about anyone's beliefs. Um, people have reasons for what they do. 
Uh, we may disagree with those reasons, uh, and those reasons may be very damaging, harmful reasons. Um, but I think it is important for us to show them that we paid the price to understand as far as we're able, without being them, where they're coming from. And of course the invitation is you'd hope they would do the same for us. It comes back to the golden rule, which uh, isn't there a bumper sticker on your vehicle about the golden rule? <laughs> anyway, um, friends, I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. I feel that we have spoken about many principles in that gospel today. Um, and uh, I testify of him who is the source of all good. I love Ether 412. It talks about how all good comes from him. Um, I'm grateful for this course uh, and the chance we've had to talk together today. And like I said, I hope these conversations don't end here. I hope you will bring them and talk about them over dinner, over lunch, over snacks, <laughs> over no food at all. <laughs> I hope you'll just talk about them with whoever you might be with. Um, and uh, I know that as we continue talking um, and continue learning in a spirit of both honesty and humility, as Isaac said, um, that we will become more like our Heavenly Father. And uh, I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Who would like to offer our closing prayer today? Cambry, would you be willing? Sure, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this day, and we're so grateful for opportunity we have to come to class today and learn about this specific lesson. Heavenly Father, please bless that we will continue our day with the Spirit and that we will be happy and optimistic throughout our day and be patient with others. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the chances we have to learn freely about specific topics and we're so grateful for thy gospel in this school and please bless that we will all not take for granted the opportunities we have in this world and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for that beautiful prayer. Well, friends, thank you so much. All right. I will look forward to our class next week, 3.30 to 5.30. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful week.